hello, hello, all you people of the class. Welcome back to another discussion of chemistry. I hope you had a great day. Uh, having a great day so far. Um, yeah, I hope you had a great week. It's Friday, right? I'm not messing that up. Yeah, it's Friday. <laughs> I had to check. <laughs> oh, what a weird world. Anyway, today is the day that we do our... Um, our meetup so hopefully you guys can make it over there um over there i'm saying like you have to move from your desk <laughs> it's a virtual world so yeah i hope you guys can make it to the meetup um yeah i guess that's happening in just a little bit so okay let us finish up chapter 16. finish up chapter 16. we have one more definition of acids and bases and um that's essentially it Okay, let's go through this. So the third definition, so, so far we have two definitions, right? And we, we are going to define a third, or going to write up a third definition of acids and bases. Okay, and this is called the Lewis acid base. If you recall the Arrhenius acid base, oops, oh. <clears throat> uh, the Arrhenius acid is an H plus donor. And the Bronsted Lowry acid right? Ooh, let's do this. It's kinda of hard to see. Bronsted Lowry Bronsted Lowry acid is an H plus donor. The Arrhenius base is a H or OH minus donor. Whereas the Brunstead Lowry base is an H plus acceptor. Lewis, uh, Lewis acid base is, has nothing to do with this. Uh, this guy's an American, by the way. Same guy who came up with Lewis dot structures. Um, dun, 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 Right, he's an American. Um, same guy who did Lewis dot structures, simplified bonding uh, significantly. Um, yeah, leave it leave it up to an American to come up with the uh, with a different definition that um, is completely different from the others. Right, we set the culture. <laughs> when the culture doesn't match what we need, we we set a new culture. Okay, um, a Lewis acid. A Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor. Okay, an electron pair acceptor. And a Lewis base is an electron pair donor. So this is uh, very different. It has nothing to do with H plus or OH minus. As a matter of fact, you don't need H plus or OH minus technically to be a Lewis acid or a Lewis base, which is very interesting. So for example, if we have H plus reacting with ammonium, ammonia, sorry, in equilibrium, you get um, this ion group here where the H plus has now attached onto these electron pairs. Okay, so we have the Lewis acid here, and this is the Lewis acid because it's an electron pair acceptor. Basically, this elect or this hydrogen atom is going over to these electron pairs, and it's it's accepting them. Okay, it's saying, uh, I accept you, electron pairs, and I want to live with you forever, and it attaches on there. 
And this is an electron pair donor. So it is, oops, I never wrote acid. This is a Lewis base. Okay, so this one accepts the electron pairs. This one donates the electron pair. Okay, now do you guys see how, how this kind of makes sense in terms of acids and bases? Um, and the interesting thing about this definition is it significantly expands what can and can't, uh, what basically what can be considered an acid. Okay, so significantly expands what can be considered an acid um, because. A Lewis acids don't have to contain H or hydrogen. They don't have to contain hydrogen at all. All of the other definitions have to do with hydrogen. Um, now the Bronsted Lowry kind of moves away from the OH minus, but the hydrogen is still there. It's a hydrogen donor and a hydrogen acceptor. Well, this definition moves completely away from H's entirely. Okay, so we can start to see things that are that don't even contain H that are considered to be an acid. For example, boron trifluoride, BF three. BF three can act as a Lewis acid. So let's react it with some ammonia, and the following reaction occurs. We have F. 3B attached to the lone pair NH3. Okay. Um, if you recall, boron is not following the octet rule here. It only has six electrons around its central core. And this actually happens with boron quite frequently. Um, and uh, because it has that empty orbital, it has space around this boron atom for the electron pair okay so basically the boron atom has an open uh, orbital that it can stick this free elect or these these uh, electron pair these free electron pairs in and then everything is happy okay so even in this case um everything's happy everything's following the octet rules still and that's how that can happen okay so this one has empty orbital. And it can accept a lone electron pair. And this guy over here, this whole piece is called an adduct. Okay. When you react a uh, Lewis acid, um, what you end up with is an adduct. Okay, so this is, kind of shows an important concept in Lewis acids. Basically, molecules or anything with empty or molecules that can create empty orbitals can act as Lewis acids. For example, if we have aluminum trichloride, what we looked at before, yeah? Aluminum trichloride. Let's see, it looks something like this. If we draw the Lewis structure, here's our homage to Lewis himself, right? Something like that, aluminum trichloride. And um, let's say that we are reacting with something like Or no, let's let's compare this with boron trichloride. Right? There's this empty orbital here, empty orbital space. 
Um, basically, anytime you have an incomplete octet, you can form, or this can act as a Lewis acid, right? Um, for example, oh, but that, that's the case where you have an incomplete octet, right? So if you start out with an incomplete octet, just like uh, aluminum trichloride and boron trichloride here, these all have incomplete octets and they can act as Lewis acids. But that's not the only thing that can act as a Lewis acid. I mentioned up here that molecules with empty orbitals can act as Lewis acids, but molecules that can force themselves to have empty orbitals can also act as a Lewis acid. For example, if we have uh, our beautiful favorite molecule here, water, okay, here's water, and we react this with another beautiful, one of my favorite molecules, carbon dioxide. Oops. That's an interesting question. What's what's your favorite molecule? You guys ever thought about that? Do you guys have a favorite molecule? My my mo my favorite molecules are the ones that are the weirdest, like water, or um, that have a lot of really nice symmetry, like carbon dioxide. It's just so nice to draw the Lewis structure of carbon dioxide that it's kind of one of my favorite molecules. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe you have to be thinking about chemistry for years before <laughs> before you actually form a, a favorite molecule. I don't know. Uh, okay, so let's let's actually switch over to red here, um, just so that we can see this a little bit easier. We can uh, here basically here is a lone pair. Okay, there's also lone pairs around these oxygens, but I'm going to focus on the lone pair on water. So here's a lone pair. This lone pair can start to um, move towards the carbon in uh, carbon dioxide. Not really move towards, but the lone pair can on, on water can start interacting with carbon. And when this happens, this pair of electrons here can flip up to be on the top of oxygen so that you end up with only um, a single bond there, okay? And this, I'm gonna switch back, back to black. Let's go. Okay, so what happens here? We have an intermediate. We have H, oops. H connected to O, connected to H, connected to carbon, connected to oxygen, connected to oxygen. Okay, something like that. Next, we have some more fun things that happen here. The lone pair on this oxygen here starts to attract the hydrogen, okay? Now the hydrogen isn't so happy, and it's not so happy because there's two, four, six, eight electrons surrounding um, Oh no, Wait, do I have something wrong here? Oh no, that's, no, that's right, sorry. Yeah, two, four, six, eight, <laughs> that's the right number. <laughs> uh, I woke up, woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. Um, this hydrogen is actually super close to these uh, lone pairs. If you remember the extent of a lone pair, it's, it's quite huge, it has a huge volume. And so this hydrogen being um, only connected to this uh, oxygen here by a single bond, it becomes quite interested in this oxygen over here, which has a huge amount of elect uh, negative um, stuff around it. Okay, it has two lone pairs, or actually it has three lone pairs, and then the one lone pair uh, that the hydrogen wants to glom onto. And so actually this lone pair will attack this hydrogen and the hydrogen's bond with oxygen will break. And the way that you represent that in um, um, in a, a mechanism. This is a mechanism for reaction, by the way. This shows you exactly how the bonds are broken and formed. Um, you show the little arrow coming off of the bond and going back towards the atom. Okay, so then finally we end up with a structure 
I'm going to move over this way so it can be consistent. That looks like this. We have H, O, double electron pairs there. Um, carbon, O, carbon, O, H. And this is our friend, carbonic acid. In this case here, water is acting as the Lewis base. Carbon dioxide is acting as the Lewis acid. Okay, we have the proton uh, electron pair donor and electron pair acceptor. Um, and after this reaction occurs, this is just carbon dioxide and water. After this reaction occurs, we end up with carbonic acid, which isn't, you know, it, it's a real acid. It makes things acidic. Um, not, not to say that Lewis acids aren't real, um, but this gives you a very clear indication of how something that is, uh, that doesn't contain hydrogen can actually affect the H plus concentration. Now, this is an interesting thing. Um, it, if you just leave a glass of water sitting out on the table, it's going to dissolve the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. Okay, a certain amount of CO2 is going to dissolve in the water. If you um, increase the pressure of CO2 on the liquid, you can force more CO2 to dissolve in the water, right? This is something like soda water. Okay, um, carbonated water, basically. Uh, it's getting pretty popular now. You can go to the store and buy some. LaCroix, um, yeah, all sorts of different brands. Um, essentially, all that stuff is, is water that's had a lot of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide forced into it by high pressures. And the carbon dioxide dissolves in the water. Um, and uh, when it dissolves in the water, you actually start to get this reaction to occur because carbon dioxide is a Lewis acid and water acts as a Lewis base. And so you end up making a bunch of carbonic acid in solution. And so if you take the uh, pH, if you look at the pH of soda water, it is acidic. Soda water is acidic simply because more carbon dioxide is dissolving into the water. All right, so um, let's see. Okay, soda water is acidic simply because of this reaction. Let's do a thought experiment. If I were to take pure, perfect H2O, pour it into a glass, and set it on the table, open to the air. What happens? I kind of hinted at this already, but what happens? What happens to the glass of water? So we have our table glass, water. What happens to this water over time? So um, <clears throat> hint number one, gases dissolve in water. Right? Hint number two, CO2 is approximately 0.04% of the atmosphere. Hint number three, CO2 is a Lewis acid. Okay, um, so what's gonna happen to this glass? The water will become acidic. It starts out at uh, T equals zero, a pH of 7.0. It's neutral. 
And then after some time, t equals really big. <laughs> Scientific term. Yeah, a couple of hours. All you, all you really have to wait. Um, it will become slightly acidic, and the pH will end up being something around 5.5 to 6.0. So if you have pure um, degassed 100% H2O water that hasn't been exposed to the atmosphere, it will have a pH of 7. If you have water that you leave sitting out and it dissolves more CO2, uh, you end up with a very, or not very, slightly acidic solution, 5.5 to 6.0. And that is simply because it is dissolving CO2 into the liquid. And um, yeah, actually, it's a really fun uh, little um, problem, really fun re little problem to actually calculate this pH starting from the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere and using the gas laws that we learned of in that one chapter. I can't remember what chapter number that was. But you can use these ideas, I think it's Raoult's law, and you can use uh, the concentration in the atmosphere to find the concentration of CO2. And if you have that, and you have the Ka for this reaction up here, then you can find out exactly what the pH is in a glass of water. Very interesting. Okay, uh, that is chapter 16. Um, when we come back for part two, I will start with chapter 17. Um, yeah, I was just thinking to myself if I have time for that. Yes, I do. And uh, yeah, I'll see you then for part two.